Christ, not man, is king. Um, very important sermon here. There's this whole thing I talked about. One of my walk and talks about this. Ben Shapiro, this wicked lost Jew, and this wicked lost Catholic, Candace Owens. And they're going back and forth, and they're bringing up this whole thing of Christ is king, Christ is king. And I'm going to show you all the different angles to this whole argument. And I'm going to prove to you today what the Bible says about Jesus Christ being king. This isn't my normal King James Bible. My normal one is actually back at our property and uh, forgot to bring it today. So I have to crack out one of the uh, larger print Bibles. This is not a Cambridge. This is a church Bible publisher Bible. I did a review on this Bible if you want to watch that. Some finer King James Bibles. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this works. Used to my old sword, but uh, this one's good too. Um, we'll start out in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Now, <clears throat> we'll start by saying that the most important thing that you can do as a Bible-believing Christian is whenever you hear a statement, especially when somebody prefaces it with the Bible says, the Bible teaches, or well, Bible teaches wouldn't be too bad, but if they say the Bible says and then give you a statement, then you take that exact statement and you be like a Berean and you search the scriptures to see if these things are so. All right. You can look it up in a Strong's Concordance. You can go with a computer program like Sword Searcher is what I use. Used it for years. Mine's really outdated, but you know, I don't really need a newer one. I don't need newer tools and things. I'm happy with my old one. And so I looked up Christ is King. Does the Bible ever say Christ is King? Meaning the King James Bible. Does it ever say Christ is King? And the answer is no, those three words never show up in succession, direct succession. They do not. Nowhere in the King James Bible does it say Christ is king. Okay, so when you see that, you say, hmm, that doesn't necessarily have to mean it's some kind of evil thing. Obviously, Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. That is true. But what are they trying to say? What are the papists saying when they say Christ is king? I'm going to show you in today's study from the King James Bible, but also Catholic sources. So, just put those over there for now. But let's start out here in Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 4. And this is the closest that you can get in the King James Bible to the statement, Christ is King. Okay? Verse 1, And the, the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. See, it's not quite worded the same as what the Catholics say. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Which is the right answer. There's no fault in Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. Number one, the Jews recognized the Roman authority of Caesar. Okay. Number two, Pilate recognized the Jewish authority. King of the Jews is not anti-Semitic. Okay, I have it in my notes here. To say that uh, Christ is king, you know, the king of the Jews, that's anti-Semitic. How could it be anti-Semitic? All right, you could say, well, we don't believe that way. It's anti-Judaism or something like that. Christianity is against what the Jewish people teach, that they reject Jesus Christ. You could say that. But Jesus came as a Jew. He, he said, I'm not sent, sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, you have to understand these things. He came to his own and his own received him not. So he's of the house and lineage of David. There's no question Jesus Christ came as a Jew. Even wicked modern Christ-rejecting Jews will acknowledge, yeah, he was a Jew. That's there. Um, I've met Jews and, you know, Jesus was a Jew. There's no question. They don't believe that he was the Messiah. They don't believe that he was God manifest in the flesh, but they understand he was a Jew. So to say Christ is king is anti-Semitic is really kind of ridiculous. But just like I said, I think it's kind of funny there that you have basically the reversal of things. Pilate is coming to the Jews and saying, this is your king. I recognize his authority. The Jews are coming back and they're saying, no, he's not our king. We recognize your authority, Pilate, Caesar. <laughs> so kind of weird. Um, and Pilate, of course, knew that Jesus was innocent. I find no fault in him. And he, he keeps doing this over and over again. And the Jews just keep saying, crucify him. And if you don't do it, you're not Caesar's friend. We're going to report you to your superiors. 
hmm, that establishing of the fifth kingdom there that was prophesied in the book of Daniel. I firmly believe that it came in when they crucified their king. That's when the iron was mixed with miry clay. Miry clay in the Bible is a reference to Israel. Hmm. Not just general anybody out there is miry clay. No, miry clay is a reference to Israel. You can watch my study I did on that whole thing about the fifth kingdom. All right. So point number one, the papal Christ is king teaching appears nowhere in the King James Bible. It's not in there. Now, Jesus Christ is a king, okay? But it's important to understand that when you have that phrase, Christ is king, that's not a Bible phrase. And here's the important part of that, all right? Right here, we have the official Roman Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church. We're going to go to number 669. All right, 669. As Lord Christ is also head of the church, which is his body, taken up to heaven and glorified after he had thus fully accomplished his mission, Christ dwells on earth in his church. The redemption is the source of the authority that Christ, by virtue of the Holy Spirit, exercises over the church. The kingdom of Christ is already present in mystery on earth the seed and the beginning of the kingdom hmm so when the catholics come out and they say christ is king christ is king what they're saying is it's representative in their own church in mystery okay the the wine and the, and the little cookie there the wafer in mystery it's the flesh and blood of jesus so it's just regular wine and you know wafer there wheat cookie or something uh yeah, but in mystery, you see. Oh, well, that's just a church over there with some crooked devil sitting up there in the, the throne or whatever else, probably a pedophile. We don't really know if Francis is a pedophile, probably to get to the position he's in. But, you know, that's not Jesus Christ over there. Oh, it is in mystery, though. So what are the Catholics really saying when they come out and they say, Christ is king, Christ is king? They're saying the Pope is king. The Pope has the authority of the earth, over the earth. The Pope is the man that all the kings of the earth are supposed to come to and bow down before. And that's exactly what happens. That's not slander. It's not anti-Catholic bigotry or whatever. I'm telling you what their catechism says and what they really believe. So when the papists come out and they're saying, Christ is king, Christ is king, they're saying the Pope is king over all the nations of the earth. And it's exactly what happened during 2020 to 2023. Papal pandemic interdict. Look it up. That's what they did. The Pope exercised his authority to say all nations will submit to the Vatican. And that's exactly what they did. That's not a conspiracy theory. It's not my opinion. It's what happened. Christ is king. The Pope is the king of the world. That's what the Catholics believe. So you get some papist devil like Candace Owens and she comes out against a lost Jewish devil like Ben Shapiro and she says, Christ is king, Christ is king. She's referring to this junk right here. She's not referring to what the scripture says. Dangerous. Number 882 in the Catholic Catechism. No, it's just a symbolic thing. It's just a symbolic thing. Oh, you'll, you'll see. You'll see. You see, the thing that the Catholics, the, the Papists don't like about me, I have their materials. I have their holiest Bibles translation down there, the Dewey Reams, the original print, everything, exact, exactly as it appeared in 1610. I have things from Jesuits, which we'll be looking at next here. The Church Teaches by Jesuit Fathers. I have this catechism right here. New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism, which I've had so many Catholics reject this. So, oh, that's not what we believe. No, we don't believe that. Yes, you do. The Imprimatur, Nihil Obstat, it's all in there. Uh, I have this stuff. And see, the Catholics, I, I'll come out and I'll just say, this is what it means. This is how it lines up with the scriptures. That's why it's satanic. And they'll say, oh, but you need to you know, get into the deeper studies. And Yeah, you, know, you mean the little, the little run around, ring around the rosy that the Catholic theologians like to do? Just run around in circles trying to confuse the people that are reading it? I cut through all that stuff. I understand what's going on. Satan is the leader and the founder of the Roman Catholic Church. It's a counterfeit church. 
It's an antichrist church. It is the antichrist system. That's what it is. And if you think I'm worried about them coming and closing down my church building, I don't have a church building. <laughs> I don't. Oh, Catholics could come and kill you. Go ahead. I'm not afraid of Catholics. And by the way, I don't hate Catholics. All right? As I've said before, I have Catholic neighborhoods in this town, or Catholic neighbors right in this town here, my neighborhood. Say it that way, and I'm nice to them. And they're kind to me. I'm not some hateful, bigoted, horrible, evil guy that you should censor me and burn me at the stake or something. It's not it at all. I am trying to warn you if you're a Catholic out there. Number 882, Catholic Catechism. The Pope, Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor is the, is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity, both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full supreme and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. Christ is king. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Now let's go to uh, number 154 here in the uh, Church Teaches. Right here it is, by Jesuit Fathers of St. Mary's College. Okay? The Church Teaches. This thing has... 252 total curses. <laughs> if you don't believe this, let him be anathema. If you don't say, if you say this, let him be anathema. Uh, a book of curses. Sounds like witchcraft to me. This is Christ's church here. This is the church that Jesus Christ founded. Let's write a book of curses against our enemies. We'll just curse everybody. You know, you don't believe with well, this same way. You're letting me anathema. Let him be anathema. <laughs> yeah, this is Christ's church. All right. Um, <clears throat> number 154. We are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under its control there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, that is the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church, the second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hand of the priest, the second by the hand of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by their permission of the priests. Sword must be subordinated to sword, and it is only fitting that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. So even if you just want to go with politics, they still have to bow down to the Pope. Show me any other leader in the world that all politicians, all the presidents and everybody else, they have to make a pilgrimage there and bow before the guy. Show me any other system. There isn't any. You get leaders out there, world leaders, they don't come to America and bow before Biden or something. But there you have it. Okay? And we could keep reading on through there and everything else, but it talks about, you know, it goes into the thing of the Pope being basically the vicar of Christ again, and, and he's, you know, in control. You say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, we don't teach that the, the Roman Catholic priests, they're not, they're not Christ. Mm, yes, you do, if you're a Roman Catholic. What we see, what we should think of. That's the, you see the priest up there that molested you last night if you're a little child, but you should think that he's Jesus with heartburn. <laughs> Your flaming heart will make you weep. I'm sorry, a little sarcasm there. <clears throat> Christ, our high priest in heaven, the priest on earth, another Christ. Hmm. The Holy Mass. Mass. The ordained priest takes the place of Christ. Well, there you have it. Very official Catholic doctrine. You have to take good care of these things. It's very important. You might get charged with blasphemy or something. <laughs> uh, or not. All right. But let's let's go to the first pope here, okay? 
Let's go to what he wrote. First Peter. We're going to see if there's anything in here about Peter saying, you know, I'm all sitting on my throne and you need to kind of bow down and, you know, give proper respect to the king of the church here and the king of earth. You know, let's see what Peter had to write about this. Let's go to first Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. Um, verse 9 through 17. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conscience honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to me the king. Oh, I'm sorry, I had the word me in there. It, whether it be to the king as supreme. So he's referring to himself. Let's keep reading. Or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. He's not talking about himself. Oh, oh yes, I think he is. Where does it say that? He's talking out that way. Honor the king. He didn't say, honor me because I am the king. I am the vicar of Christ. doesn't say it. 1 Peter chapter 5. And read through. Go the whole way through First and Second Peter and show me any place where he says that he's a king or that he's in a ruling position. Show it to me. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, let's see here. Verses 1 through 5. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who also, who am also an elder. Shouldn't he be saying that he's the biggest of the elders or the best or the you know king or something? No, he just includes himself in with all the other elders. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You say, well, right there, though, he said he's taking the oversight. See, he's taking the oversight. But he's saying, I'm just another one of the elders. The elders are supposed to have the oversight of their individual flock that they're with. Look at verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You're not supposed to lord over the people. Why would Peter, the first pope slash king, say a thing like that if he's in a leading position? The throne of St. Peter, where the Pope sits. Apparently not. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The crown comes in the future, at the judgment seat of Christ. Not right now. Peter doesn't say, well, see, I have a crown. You know, it's kind of like that. But, you know, it doesn't say that. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility, for God resist, resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Doesn't sound like he was a very good pope slash king. Because he wasn't. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You say, well, he was a king, he was a pope, he was, he was the first pope, but he was still had a, you know, the attitude of a servant. That's what popes are supposed to be. They, they serve the church. And the, uh, but that's not what he's writing there. Okay, it's not about that. And again, if you want to make it into that thing, then show me the verses where he talks about being a king, where he's sitting on a throne. He's a servant, not a king. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Okay? Us, the apostles. Not me, the head apostle, or me, the pope. 
he just includes himself again, just as I'm just another one of the guys here. I, I'm not any kind of special position. See, what you have to do as a Roman Catholic is you have to search the scriptures. You have your divine traditions, you have your church elders and church traditions and fathers, and you have all that stuff. But when they contradict the scriptures, this is divinely inspired. Tr church tradition is not. Now, I know you believe it is, but the whole thing is, if your church your tradition is inspired and the scriptures are inspired and they contradict, then you have a contradicting God. Kind of a problem, isn't it? Point number two, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not here yet. John 18. Go to John 18. And this is very important to get. You see, if the kingdom of Jesus Christ is yet to come in the future, the pre-millennial coming of Jesus Christ where he comes down and sets up his kingdom and then he physically rules and reigns his kingdom, if that's yet in the future, well then the Catholic has really no right to say that um, they can somehow uh, claim authority over the kings of the earth right now. That's not there. But you know, when you transition from being Caesar to uh, the Emperor of Rome, to then, you know, the uh, Pontificus Maximus becomes Pontificus, um, or the Supreme Pontiff, sorry. Well, then you have to, you know, maintain that Roman authority there. John chapter 18, verse 33 through 40. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests hath, hath, have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Now here's, pay attention to this, very important. In your King James Bible, a lot of new versions change this. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus is not saying that he will never have an earthly kingdom. A lot of heretics come along, they'll seize that thing. They say, Jesus said my kingdom's not of this world. See, there's no kingdom that's coming. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying my kingdom's not from hence. But now, you see, there's a conditional clause there. It's not, my kingdom is not of this world. Not now, nor ever will be. It doesn't say that. It's, but now is my kingdom not from hence. It's going to come someday. It's part of prophecy, very important prophecy for the future. But now it's not from hence. It's not here. This I'm in Jerusalem here. I'm, I'm being tried as a thief. Um, but you know I can't set up my kingdom right now because my nation rejected me. The Jewish people rejected me. Um, lots of them, not all of them, thankfully. But... Uh, I can't set up my kingdom right now. That's what's going on there. But it's going to come in the future. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Good philosophical thing to say there, as a pagan. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? He's calling him king. He knows who he is. Verse 40, Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Hmm. Uh, again, notice a few things here. As I said before, the millennial kingdom was not from hence. All right? Number two, Jesus was born to be a king in the end. To this end was I born. All right? In other words, that's what I'm going to be. That's my total fulfillment of why I came down here to the earth. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. He came and he offered the kingdom. You see? They were in the fourth kingdom. There were five kingdoms prophesied. They're in the fourth kingdom. Jesus comes down and says, okay, you're yoking, starting to yoke up here with Rome, the, the Jewish leadership and things. 
um, we can put an end to this fifth kingdom very quickly here. Accept me as your Messiah. Accept me and I will become your king. They rejected. Okay. My kingdom's not from hence. Uh, the end that I had planned there is going to be put off for some time. Jesus is the truth. John 14, verse 6 talks about that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh un unto the Father but by me. Again, a very important thing to understand there. But the Jews at that time rejected Jesus, the truth, and wanted the thief Barabbas instead. Hmm. Um, kind of an interesting thing there because Jewish merchants are known for lying and stealing. So they lied about Jesus and they wanted a thief. They were felt more comfortable with the thief than God manifest in the flesh. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing because if you look at the history of the Jewish people, particularly the uh, what we call the papal Juden, the ones, the Jews that have yoked up with Rome, those people have mingled themselves and they've done all kinds of things. It's just all about money. Hollywood run by the these papal Juden. Um, again, they're not just, oh, well, it's just the Jews. They run everything. No, there's Catholic tie-ins there. The Catholics are also involved in it. Look at all the papal Juden uh, stuff that's come out of Hollywood, all the many times that they've made Hollywood movies and TV shows and whatever, and they always make the Catholic priests look like a good guy or nuns look like good people, good women and things like that. Um, you have the sound of mu music. The, the nun goes and she marries the German guy and, and then you have Sister Act and you have uh, M.A.S.H. with Father Mulcahy and you have uh, all these uh, different ones, different movies, different TV shows. They're always making the Catholics look good. Why would Jewish-owned media always try to make the Catholics look good? It's almost like there's a fifth kingdom where Ahab and Jezebel have yoked up together and they're working together. That's probably a conspiracy theory, though, so don't take that too seriously. Matthew chapter 11. Oh, boy. Just dig my hole deeper and deeper, don't I? I can never be a normal preacher again. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew is always a reference. It's the only book where it appears. It's always a reference to a physical kingdom on this earth that's headquartered in Jerusalem. That's why it's talking about that. It suffers violence. How often do you see that? There's been a bombing in Jerusalem. There's been an attack on Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. There's always, you know, fighting going on over there. And for... Thousands of years, they've been fighting over that city. And if you understand the Old Testament, it wasn't even that, that the Jews came in there and built the city and whatever and then called it Jerusalem. No, it was actually there before. And they came and they took it from pagan people. Hmm. Next, let's go to Daniel chapter 11. The violent take it by what? Force. Huh. Violent take it by force. In the past. It won't happen anymore in the future. They're all done with fighting over there. They will never hear about it again. I don't think so. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Interesting with flatteries there, the whole thing. When you really understand a lot of what's going on, you'll realize how prevalent witchcraft is. Witchcraft, again, if you want to define it by just the most simple definition, witchcraft is bending, shaping, and changing reality. So you have Hollywood, they will tell you a vision, television, through witchcraft. And they put spells on people. And they do this thing through flatteries. You know, and the commercials come out and you have a pretty woman selling you a bar of soap or something. Or a pretty woman t selling you pharmaceuticals nowadays. <laughs> uh, or smiling, happy people running along and jogging as they're doing it. It's witchcraft. That's what it is. And, you know, the Greek word pharmakia is 
translated in your King James Bible as witchcraft. Uh, pharmakia is also the root word for pharmaceutical. So an interesting thing there. But this thing of flatteries, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about this, the thing of um, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It goes on, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, commanding to abstain from meat, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. But it's interesting. It's a seducing spirit. Jezebel, which seduces my servants. Huh. Jezebel is Rome. Ahab is Israel. If you understand that relationship there. Again, watch my study. Some really deep stuff there to get into. You start to study this stuff and you realize there's no way that this is, this is a man-made book. No way. Well, the King James Bible is an error. The King, it's full of errors. Oh, you're lost. Okay, there's no nice way for me to put it. You think that this book's full of errors and you can make fun of this book and mock this blessed book? Uh, you've got some major problems. Okay, <laughs> this book is a spiritual book on a, a whole different level. And the tie-ins and everything else, how it all intertwines together, it's incredible. It's amazing. But this book only works if you believe it. Very under, important to understand that. God will only reveal things to you out of his word as long as you have faith, as long as you believe what you're reading is God's word. And the new version people, they don't believe that anything is God's word. I mean, unless you're just brand new saved, you might get somebody that believes that the NIV is God's perfect word and whatever, and there's no errors in it. But uh, you've been saved for a little bit of time and you still are into the new versions or you claim to be saved for a while and you're into the new versions. I have some major questions. But um, continuing here, um, <clears throat> verse 35 and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces. Take the kingdom by force. huh? And a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Interesting. Um, kind of a, maybe another little tie in there because you have the merchants over in the book of James and they're weeping and wailing and things for their, well, that's back in Revelation. But the merchants of the earth, they've heaped to themselves treasure in the last days, for the last days, and that's gold and silver. And that basically the rust of them is a testimony against them. Uh, could it be that it gets to a point where the gold and silver is all confiscated to build this Antichrist temple, which you're seeing right there? He's, you know, uh, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things, tied in again with Mystery Babylon. And could it be that this stuff is all confiscated in the future and the people that store it away and they kind of stockpile it, you know, as a way to just sort of, oh man, it really was, you know, we're seeing the hyperinflation of the currency right now and gold and silver is being bought up by a lot of people and the merchants are going to start to say, okay, we'll, we'll exchange fiat currencies in the future for it as the fiat currencies are hyperinflating and then they'll have all this gold and silver that they've purchased, that they've paid money for and then they're just going to kind of hoard it away and eventually it'll be okay you have to turn it in and some of them will just kind of hoard it but it'll get to the point where it'll just be useless that's my theory on it but again very interesting that the the kingdom of heaven is taken by force and the antichrist comes along and he and he honors a god of forces hmm the god of forces interesting point number three uh, there is more than one Christ. That's important to get as well. So somebody comes out and says Christ is king. Um, you need to define which one we're talking about here. Go to Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 11. And verse 15. 
The Bible says here, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Why doesn't it just say the Lord and, and Christ? No, the Lord and His Christ. Because the devil tries to imitate whatever God does. So, the Lord has a Christ, the devil has a Christ. Hmm. Luke chapter 9, I'll show you another one here about the difference between two different Christs. Luke chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. The Bible says, He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, answering said, The Christ of God. Huh. And he straightly charged them that, and commanded them to tell no man that thing saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. All right, so there you have that. Um, so again, you have the Christ of God. First John chapter 2. Go on over to First John chapter 2. It's so important to go through the scriptures, brethren. Um, <clears throat> if I'm just standing here giving you my opinion and ranting and raving and church father this and so-and-so said that and whatever, that's not important. What's important is I need to be able to say, here's where you turn in your Bible, your King James Bible. Look it up for yourself. Make sure that you're seeing this for yourself. Check out everything I say. A man that's trying to tell you the truth will do that. He'll give you the source documents and, and whatever, and he'll say, okay, look this stuff up. Do your own due diligence. Get a King James Bible, a print King James Bible. There is no such thing as the Mandela effect. That's a satanic nonsense brought up by a, a witch from Hollywood, Fiona Broom. We exposed that whole thing, and there's no truth to this King James Bible being changed. Argued with, that, with idiots over the years on that whole thing. Fools would be the more appropriate biblical term. Excuse me. But... Um, your King James Bible is very important to have. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 through 23. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Again, it doesn't say Christ is king. Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And again, if you understand the Godhead doctrine, I wrote my book here about it, um, you'll see that the Father and the Son are the same being. They're not the same part. They're not the same thing. Okay, please understand that. The body and the soul are two different things, two different parts of one being. There's only one person in the Godhead. And that's God. Okay? Uh, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God. See how it works. But if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. You're like a lot of the Jews today. They deny Jesus as the Son. They deny Him as God. And so then they, they can't turn around and say, but we believe in Jehovah God. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you don't have the Son, then you don't have the Father. Right? But he that acknowledgeth the, acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So if you want to have a relationship with the Father and you're a Jew, then you need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because they're the same being. Two separate parts of the same being. It's not heresy, it's what the Bible teaches. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Be very careful when you see guys. It, it's one thing to be just quoting this verse from memory, and by mistake you say Jesus Christ has come in the flesh because you're thinking first century, you know, he has come in the flesh. I can have some grace there. But if you have some guy and he says, turn in your Bible, and he's looking at the verse, and he's reading it, and he says... Uh, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. You say, whoa, whoa, hold on. It doesn't say has. Has and is are two different words. They're not interchangeable. They're not synonymous. All right? 
has is past tense. Is is present, present tense. Jesus Christ still is in the flesh. He is in an incorruptible body now, a flesh. He's not some historical character that you read about. He is come in the flesh. And if you don't confess that, there's a spirit of Antichrist there. And notice it says it two times. <clears throat> um, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is, uh, is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So two times there. Verse 2, verse 3. And one in each verse, it's saying that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Very important to get. An extremely important thing. And there's a lot of guys on, on YouTube here uh, that are call themselves King James only, King James Bible believers, whatever. And I've seen them mess up this passage while turning there, looking at the, the text of Scripture, and they are reading it, and it comes out, has. I don't think the Holy Spirit's there telling them to do that. Was well, a slip of the tongue and whatever. It's uh, not what the Bible says. It doesn't say, if, unless they make a slip of the tongue, then it's okay. Be careful who you're listening to. Again, read along in your King James Bible. 2 John chapter 1. I mean, without a King James Bible, how could you pick up on it? Some guy says, has come in the flesh. You'd say, oh, wow, that sounds right. You know, it doesn't sound like an open heresy. But it's not what the King James Bible says. It says, is come in the flesh. 2 John chapter 1 verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. There it is again, third time. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So yeah, there is an antichrist. Somebody who's against Jesus, but also a counterfeit for Jesus. Some guy that has come in the flesh. Um, not is come in the flesh. A lot of antichrists out there, brethren. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> verses 4 through 5. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Where did we see that earlier? I went and all my bookmarks fell out now, and I threw it on the floor. Isn't that terrible? Um... Right there. Roman Catholic official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That there's another Christ. That the priest on earth is another Christ. I showed it. Now I have to try to get back to it because my bookmarks fell out when I chucked the stupid thing across the room there. Not really across the room, it's just more down that way. There's one of them. That one stayed in. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. I think that the Catholic uh, priests have qualified for the thing of deceiving people by saying that they are Christ. Just a little bit. And I showed you in the other study, too, you know, that the uh, actual catechism, again, oh, the Baltimore Catechism, we don't go along with that. Well, the actual catechism also says that... Uh, <clears throat> that we are other Christs and things. I mean, right here, uh, number 460, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God, the only begotten Son of God, wanted, wanting to make us shares in His divinity, assumed our nature so that He made man, might make men gods. Right there. Okay. So, and it, it goes into another thing here. I don't remember where the page is at. It's in my study on... The Catholic Church teaching that, you know, you can become God and Christ. And it actually says, just as plain as day, that... Is that it? Yeah, okay. Here it is. Um, number 2782 in the Catechism. We can adore the Father because He has caused us to be reborn to His life by adopting us as His children and His only Son. By baptism, He incorporates us into the body of His Christ through the anointing of His Spirit who flows from the head to the members, but makes us other Christs. And it says, God indeed, who has predestinated us to adoption as his sons, has conformed us to the glorious body of Christ 
So then you who are who have become sharers in Christ are appropriately, appropriately called Christ's. There it is. You can see it right there. What more can I say? Open and shut case. But now, does the King James Bible teach that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Yes, it does. Let me show you the scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's go there first. This one's a little bit weird to flip around through. It's in not my normal preaching Bible, as I said in one of the other videos. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13 through 16. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. What was one of the things that Jesus confessed there? I'm a king. To this end was I born, and this is why I came into the world. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Mixing up the wording a little bit there, but that's what he said. That was the good confession that he said before Pontius Pilate. Verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Who is the light? which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen. Do the study in the scriptures. My Father, you can't see my Father. No man has seen the Father at any time. Okay, what's going on there? The soul. You can't see the shape of a soul in terms of the Father there. You can see a, maybe a, a form or something, but you can't see what he actually looks like. You can't see him. You can't understand who the, who the soul of the Godhead is. But Jesus Christ is the physical outward adornment of the soul that's within him that's what it's talking about you say well that's heresy it's heresy there's three persons in the trinity three persons in the trinity okay then how do you work out the thing there which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of lords what's that do for the father and the holy spirit if jesus christ is the only potentate the highest being in heaven according to this passage here what does that do for the Father and the Holy Spirit if they're separate persons? Jesus is the king and the Father's what? A peasant? The prince or something, perhaps? No. They're three parts of one being. It's really not that hard to figure out. But you believe out there, Christ is king. Our catechism teaches that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's Christ's representative on earth. The church has a right to rule the other kingdoms and things. Um, then what do you do with this verse? Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. Christ, not man, is king. You come along saying Christ is king and you're referring to your Pope, you're a wicked, Bible-rejecting, hell-bound sinner. Period. It's the way it is. Jesus is the only potentate, the only one who can say I'm the king. That's why Oliver Cromwell, when he died, he put on his grave there, he said, Christ, not man, is king. Hey, Oliver, you're taking over the forces of parliament. We won the, the British Civil War. And uh, King Charles, we, we're deposing him. We want you to become king. Cromwell said, no. Christ, Jesus Christ, not man, is king. Don't you dare give me the title. I don't want to be the king. That's the title for Jesus Christ. Why? Because Oliver Cromwell knew this passage right here. That's why. And unlike the Catholics, he actually feared God enough to read the Bible. Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat, on him, up, sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. It, Pope tries to, you know, the papal whole system, they try to uh, copy that, and they'll have the Pope when he's got this mitre on, and it's multi-tiered, the multi-tiered tiara, <laughs> something, you know, effeminate queer or something, you know, he's wearing a tiara, multi-tiered tiara. <laughs> and you were going to worship a guy like that, walking around in a robe with slippers on, silk slippers, you know fruitcake i mean yeah okay and again oh you're being disrespectful where is it at in scripture it's not there <laughs> peter didn't ever have that kind of a thing on special robes on and whatever else peter's a fisherman <laughs> rough crude you know tough guy not getting his little robe and things like this and come kiss my ring <laughs> you know, kiss my toe i'll stick out my little pointy toe with my slipper <laughs> You know, walk around in my bathrobe or whatever else. And I'll put, bring me my tiara, my multi-tiered tiara. <laughs> yes, Holy Father. <laughs> get out of that system. If you're, if you're a man, you still have some red blood in you, get out of that papal witchcraft system. Get as far away from that as you can. All right, that was verse 11. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself did read that. Verse 13, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Can't wait for that. I'm not much of a horse rider right now, but I will be in the future. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The sharp sword comes out of his mouth. He speaks this book, and he's going to slay a lot of people with what he has to say, his words. That's all he needs. He doesn't need a physical sword like this. Okay? He's got this, the spiritual sword. It's a lot more powerful. Verse 16, And on his... And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And again, it's saying on his vesture, his clothing, we're out on his clothing. And on his thigh, a name written. Jesus doesn't have a tattoo, okay? He's not have a tattoo and he's wearing Daisy Dukes or a miniskirt or something like that. Okay, to show off his tattoo, his neat tattoo he just got. I mean, again, well, I believe it's a tattoo. Okay, when did he get it? All right, where's it at in the scriptures that Jesus is laying there and, you know, here's God manifest in the flesh. What, did Michael give it to him or something? You know, the archangel was, like, you know, on the God manifest in the flesh or something. I mean, people come up with the dumbest things out there. It's on his vesture. And the location on his vesture, on his clothing, is at his thigh area down there. <laughs> the links people go to to pervert the scriptures. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Huh. Reigning with Jesus Christ. Almost like he's the king of the earth. But now is my kingdom not from hence. It's coming in the future. To this end was I born to be a king. Christ is king right now. Well, that depends on how you define it. That term there, friend, is not in scripture. Christ, not man, is king. That's a lot better. Jesus Christ will be king over all the earth in the future. Even better. Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. That's scripture. You see? It's so important. Before you just rush out and say, praise the Lord, all these people are saying Christ is king. Well, that's it's good that they're talking about Jesus Christ, rather him than some kind of pagan celebrity or something like that. Good. It's good that Jesus Christ is getting some press time. The name Christ. But you have to remember, there's two different Christs. And also, the Catholic teaching of who Christ is and what Christ is king actually means. That's the whole point of this study. Finally, let's go to Luke chapter 1. We will end here in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33. 
And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Huh. What did we just read? Oh, that would be Luke chapter 1. There's only one God. Verse 30 is where we began. Jesus was 30 years old when he began to do his earthly ministry. And we read to verse 33. Huh. He was 33 years old when he died. So are you implying that the chapter and verse numbers are inspired? Yeah. Kind of leans that way. So, uh, I thank the Lord for his word. And, um, and in a weird sort of way, I kind of thank the Lord for the weird stuff that goes on here and the odd things that happen and whatever else, because it gives us a chance as Bible believers to examine the things and to say, okay, well, this is good. I'm glad that this happened. And, but what, do, what does the Bible say? I wonder what the scriptures say. That's where my letter's onto the ground. Hmm. That's interesting. And these are the opportunities that we need. You get somebody at work, some coworker, some relative, and they say, hey, what do you think about this whole Christ is King thing? Hey, here's a video that you can share with them. Of course, most of them don't have the attention span to sit through this whole thing, I realize. <laughs> but uh, I get a little bit long-winded sometimes, I guess. But, I, you know, I have to go through the scriptures. And I try to make these studies as entertaining, and not, well, not entertaining, but as uh, educational and, you know, I, I mean, whatever. I'm trying to make it uh, interesting to watch. Okay, I'm not trying to say that I'm entertaining people. Um, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Uh, so that will be it for this study. I still have <clears throat> two more to go. Oh, actually, no, three more. Yeah, three more studies to go. So, suffering for the Lord here, but <laughs> if you call this suffering, uh, <clears throat> this is actually fun for me. So, but um, hopefully my voice will last long enough to get all this stuff done. But uh, now you have your answer. This whole thing of Christ is King. Well, it's tricky. You have to get into the scriptures to really figure this whole thing out. Um, so, use this as an opportunity to witness to people. And show them what the Bible actually says about the thing of Jesus Christ being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And his kingdom's not here right now. And the Pope is definitely not sitting in Christ's stead and ruling in things and doing what Christ would do if he was on the earth. Okay? Please don't forget that. So that will be it. See you in the next study.